We're going to go to the word of the Lord right now. We're reading from Genesis chapter 18, beginning at verse 16 and going to 19. If you'd stand to your feet, please. We're going to read together from the New International Version of the Bible. Praise God. Online, we, we, we love having you. Thank you so much for coming. It is Genesis chapter 18, reading from verse 16 to 19. And the Bible reads, When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now as we enter into your word. We commit your people to you. Open the soil of the hearts of your people to receive the seed of your word. Touch this vessel, Lord God, to be a vessel of honor to you as I obediently share what you've given to me. And bless this place with the presence of your spirit as you've already done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Smile at somebody before you take your seat, please. Amen. Amen. Praise God. How appropriate that we had a baby blessing today. Uh, the sermon title, as you've seen, is Raising Children. And, you know, there are a number of folks in our assembly, certainly, who are in the throes of raising children right now. And we know that there are good days and then there are difficult days when you're raising children. And so, um, you know, the key thing is that we, we want everybody at faith, but certainly the children, to be raised in the fear of the Lord and to become the very best that God created them to be. This is our desire. Um, this is God's will. You know, whether they're gonna be leaders or experts in particular fields or, or community makers, whatever it is that they are given to do by God's gifting in them, we want them to be the very best that God created them to be. We want them to thrive in the Lord. Now, last week I talked about respecting your body. It's the temple of God. That's what I talked about. And this week, I'd like to expand a little bit on that now and talk about more than just your personal or individual body. I want to talk about the wider body that proceeds from you. And so, uh, the 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 key message today that you really should get is this. Raise your children deliberately, not by chance. Raise your children deliberately, not by chance. Now, uh, at about this point, um, you see I'm learning this and I have some folks that I kind of chat to about the, about the message just to make sure that the message that God has given to me comes out in the way that he gave it to me. So I try to make sure uh, in advance as part of my preparation that, that people understand what it is that I'm saying. So I, I share it and get feedback in advance. Um, one of the things that, that, that I found, and this is from personal experience too, having been in the congregation, is the first few words that the preacher preaches, we kind of, we, we select, we have filters, and we say, Mm, not for me, that's okay. And then that means I've got another 30 or 40 minutes to just kind of coast. I'm listening to the word, it's coming, but it's not for me, it's for someone else. And so when you talk about raising children, typically the one who doesn't have natural children 
thinks, well, that's not for me. But, but I, that would be a mistake. Because we're talking here about natural children and spiritual children. Let me give you an example. I have two children. I, I, I always hesitate when I say children now because people say, then why are they bigger than you? But we'll leave that for another day. I have two children, and to the best of my ability, I was deliberate in, in raising them, deliberate in terms of setting biblical boundaries, uh, deliberate in going out with, uh, what's that about the rod and staff that comfort me? I went with that as well. It, I, was, I tried to, I mean, I was deliberate. I didn't do it haphazardly. I knew what it is that I wanted to transfer to them. They were my children entrusted to me naturally, and, um, and I did the best that I could. Of course, everybody's hearing me saying, I, 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 and you know that it was this Lucy who was doing everything. So that, I, I, I get it. I get it. I'm okay. Uh, but but um, when, I was, uh, when I was 19 years old at university, I met a guy. His name is Douglas M., we'll call it. Uh, we won't say his full last name in case he's listening at some point in the future. Uh, but, but what happened was I was frustrated because I had recently received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and I saw religious people, uh, and these religious people professed a form of godliness while they denied the power therein. So they were religious, but they were denying everything that the Bible says. I mean, everything, right? And, and I was frustrated, and, and I was sharing actually my frustration. And, uh, and Douglas was listening to me and nodding his head, and, and I mean, I wasn't expecting anything, and I was directly telling him how it's futile to live that life. Like, I mean, what's the use of saying I'm a Christian, in the meantime, you, the Bible is actually saying you're on your way to hell because you believe nothing about what the Bible says. That's how I was talking, and, and Douglas was nodding his head. I wasn't expecting anything really wasn't expecting anything. So when I was done, he said, so then what do I have to do? Because I go to church, but I, what you're telling me, I've never encountered it before. And so I was a bit surprised. You, you know when, when, you, when, you, when you're really going at it and then you realize there's nothing there and you're trying to skid to a halt and back it up and apologize for what you just said? That's, that's kind of where I was. And anyway, I said, well, you know, took him to the scriptures, about being born again, Douglas says, you're not really like that. And so, I, I couldn't believe this was happening. I said, okay, let's go. Took him, we went to some folks who have been Christians longer than I, and we prayed for him. <laughs> and uh, you gotta get this piece. I mean, uh, after I accepted the Lord, I really wanted the gift of speaking in tongues. It was so important. I saw it in the scripture, and I really felt that it was important and I tried, and I prayed, and I backslid, I did everything. The Lord just wouldn't allow it. A whole year, and then I received the gift. I, I'll never forget that day. It was awesome. So this is a little bit after that, that I'm speaking to Douglas. Douglas, yes, okay, fine, we go over. And this happened not only with Douglas, it happened with someone else as well. But we end up going into this room with these senior Christians. We pray for Douglas. Douglas gives his life to the Lord and start speaking in tongues. Uh, and so while he's speaking in tongues, I left them to pray, and I went to talk to the Lord to say, it's, not, it's going to take one year. <laughs> and you know, Douglas, uh, I, Douglas was my spiritual son, same age, my spiritual son for about two years before we kind of left university and went off and did a whole bunch of other things. I didn't see him, haven't seen him for over, well, probably for about 40 years I haven't seen him. Preparing for the sermon a few, a little while ago, I Googled Douglas. He's some big shot doing some regional marketing executive or something like that. Listen to this. He is still serving the Lord like with power. So, what I'd like to say about this message today is that I hope you realize that it's not just about raising natural children, because you will raise more spiritual children in your life than you will raise natural children. So this, I'll talk about natural children, but spiritual children 
is really, really important. And there are many spiritual children, even in this house today, on the path of discipleship. And so we have to pay attention when we're raising children. The fathers that were standing there while the children were worshiping, children follow their fathers. But the young people that you saw worshiping over here, those are spiritual parents. And you are going to see an explosion in the worship of our youth. And many of them will be following their fathers and mothers who don't know their fathers and mothers, who don't realize that their worship today was more than just them worshiping. They were setting examples as parents in the Lord. So as I speak, don't make the mistake of thinking that this is only about natural children. No, it's about more than that. Where, where, where do we have an example in the Bible where you have a demonstration of both being a natural parent and a spiritual parent at the same time? I think we have a great example in Abraham. And so that's why I read the scripture that I read, and we want to unpack that scripture just a little bit. We read about how the men got up to leave, and so they looked towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Now, while they're walking with the Lord, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? You see, that's, that's the conundrum that God has when we come close to him. It's because he's not very good at hiding his love and his intentions for us. He wants us to know what he wants for us. So when we come up close to him, he starts telling us secrets about our future. Right? In Amos chapter three, verse seven, he says, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And, and so we should be looking at the examples of the heroes of our faith as we find it in Hebrews chapter 11. Heroes like Abraham, who we're gonna talk about, but not only Abraham. I mean, you can take a look at Jacob, you can take a look at Joseph, you can take a look at Moses, you can take a look at Gideon, you can take a look at Jesus, you can take a look at Peter, you can take a look at Paul. So many examples of heroes of our faith. Amen. Amen. And, I, and I, I really want you to catch this. I hope God help us to catch this. You can take a look at F.W. McKenzie. You can take a look at Pastor Granville McKenzie. Now, why am I saying that? The reason I'm saying that is because this is a lineage starting way back of heroes of faith who knew how to parent their children. Amen. And, 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 and you and I, it's our act now. This is our time. We are the ones to go into the future of Hebrews 11 and take our place as heroes of faith in the future. Amen. And that's the way we ought to be thinking about it. Don't, don't look down upon what God is doing in the lives of people just because you happen to live in the same time that they live in. No, God is using people even today to be these parents. And so let's take a look then at the story of Abraham. I mean, God chose Abraham so that he would direct his children and his household after him. Abraham was told to direct his children. Who were Abraham's children? Well, certainly there was Isaac, who was the son of Sarah, and he was the child of the promise. He was the one through which the natural blessing would go. He was, his lineage was really the natural lineage that we go back to Scripture to. And God says that he was supposed to direct Isaac, but more than Isaac, 
He had Ishmael, who was actually his eldest son. And more than that, he had six other sons with Keturah. Knowing Abraham, it is most likely that he directed all his children who were from his natural uh, uh, lineage, he directed them in the way of the Lord. But he didn't end with the line of Isaac. The Bible says that he was to direct his, in that scripture, his household, right? So Abraham is directing his children. God says, I know he will direct his children and his household. Now, when you come to his household, you're going to see that's more than just his biological children. In fact, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 27, as a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham, the Bible says, and every male in Abraham's household, including those who were born in his household or bought from a foreigner, was circumcised with him. So Abraham was not just directing his biological children in the way of the Lord, but he was directing the entire household that God had given to him. He was directing them in the, house of the, in, in the way of the Lord too. And it, it didn't end with his generation because the Bible says that he, he, he should direct his household after him. So in other words, it didn't end with just that household of that generation, but the household of Abraham that would extend into the future, Abraham was to direct that household. Amen. And so today, as we look at the scripture, as we are doing right now, it is a result of Abraham directing not only his children with him, but his entire household. We are the children of Abraham by faith. And we are now under that same direction. That's what it means to direct his household. You know, this week I, I, I read about a teacher who in 1978, he at a science class, and he was showing them the trajectories of uh, the ecliptical paths, like the eclipse that we experienced. And he was, he was kind of using paths, and he found one, and he, and he predicted to that little class that, yeah, you know, this one should, this is going to take a while, maybe about four or five decades in 2024, it'll come past, you know, upstate New York, which is where they were. And... Uh, so the response of the children, they were, I mean, I don't know how old they were, maybe, let's say 12, 13, their responses would have been, you know, various. Some would have said, um, he's full of it, we don't, we'd, how does he know that? Others would have said, boring. Others would have said, hey, you know something? That's interesting. I wonder if it'll actually happen. And the others would have said, this is a great science teacher, definitely that's going to happen. Okay? I mean, uh, various responses, right? Uh, Fast forward about 50 years, and there was a picture of them, about 30 plus people from that class got together with that teacher and they watched the eclipse. So here's the point. 50 or so years ago, when people, when children were doubting him, when they were figuring stuff out for themselves, the only thing that the teacher could do was to give them the direction that he knew to be true. That's, that's all he could do. There was no eclipse as evidence at that time. So all he could do was say, listen, this is true. I know it's true. And he could give it to them. That's all. Watch now. This week, if there were any doubters of those children, and now the evidence was in front of them, that the teacher knew was going to happen, but that they didn't, now those children were adults, now they can see it happening, but it's too late for them to now go back and agree with what the teacher said. The thing about parenting is children don't know what they should do. They don't know what's right. Listen, Proverbs twenty-two fifteen: Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. 
folly maybe is uh, King James language. The heart of a child is foolish. Does that make better sense? Get, get me, get me. That is not an insult to children. That is direction to parents. That is telling parents, I'm going to use other words, that the children are innocent because they don't know. And if you leave them without telling them the truth, then they most likely will go astray. This thing about just leave them and let them figure it out, they'll be all right, is fine for the world, is absolutely unacceptable in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not getting a good response. So there are a lot of teachers here who learned that theory at university. It's wrong not to teach the children the truth, even when they push back. They will push back. But you know the truth. So how can you stand back and say, okay, they'll figure it out on their own? They won't. Now, you don't, you don't believe me, right? <laughs> you, you know, how much time do our children spend under the instruction of the world? How much time? I mean, you can count it. I, and look, I'm not talking just about, uh, again, natural children going to school. I'm talking about uh, people who've just given their lives to the Lord and they're going to work for the whole week. And, and at work, they're going to be under the instruction and influence of the world. Right? How much time do they spend under that direction versus under the direction of the Word of God? Uh, it's, not even, it's not even a competition. I mean, so much more time is spent learning from the world. That is why it is important for us as parents, again, not just natural parents. You young people worshiping here who know you are leaders, some of you pray with me every day at quarter to five, I'm proud of you. But you that are worshiping here, there are people that watch you, that will follow you, right? And so you must understand that, and understand that like one hour of instruction out of 168, is not adequate to compete with the pressure that's coming from the world. And so in your home, that's why you must pray every day. You must read your Bible every day. You, with your children, you must do that. I'm telling you, th that's why we are trying to extend prayer to 24-7 coverage. We want you to be able to tap in and have some godly person leading you in prayer anytime you want. <laughs> Folks, this is really important because the world is not letting up. The world has its agenda. And so God could trust Abraham to direct his children after him. But as the saying goes, you've got to talk the talk and then you've got to walk the walk. And so God chose Abraham to keep his way by doing what is right and just. Abraham was to keep God's way. Proverbs chapter 14 and 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death to death. You know, conventional wisdom is, is now, I mean, everybody knows that there are many different paths that you can follow. It's accepted, pretty much. And, and why do you think that your way is the right way, or why do you think that your way is the only way? Kind of something like maybe what might have happened with that teacher when he was talking about the trajectories to those young people. Now, that's how it is when you have conversations with people. But the teacher knew and was proven right 50 years later. There is a way that appears right to a man. There are many of those. The, 
the thing we teach our children is that, folks, listen, there is only one way to God. That is through Jesus. Period. And yes, we love people, and yes, we spend time with people explaining and exploring, and yes, we don't know everything, but, but we know that there's only one way. And we know this. We know that even if they don't agree right now, like some of those kids who were saying, ah, it's foolish, um, there's going to come the time when they will agree. And they'll come to the same conclusion that Solomon did, if indeed he was the one who wrote Ecclesiastes. That says, after I've considered everything in life, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That is the whole duty of man. That's all. They're going to come to that conclusion. They will come to that conclusion. And at that time, every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. So parents that are in the house, what I'm saying to you is you know that. You know it to be true. Don't let your kids lead you. Spiritually speaking, don't be afraid to tell new Christians the truth of the gospel. Don't be afraid to disciple new Christians so that they change from the life that they were living into a transformed life. Don't be afraid. You are the one who knows it. They don't. Brother Fred, that's why God trusts you as a parent to give them the truth. Give it. In the end, they're going to agree with you. And if you fuzzy wuzzy, in the end, like there's a kid who actually took his parents to court for not raising him right. Can you imagine your kid taking you to the Lord's court and saying, this moron didn't tell me the truth? You, you have the truth. Like you know what the truth is. Don't be pressured. Teach them the truth. Walk the truth with them. Abraham was to do what is right. And so the question is, how does an unsaved person come to know what is right? A lot of the time we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Now there's, there's a part that we have to play, for sure. We've got to extend the invitation to the harvest. There are things we need to do. But watch what happened with Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, 6. Abraham believed God and he credited it to him as righteousness. It was Faith, talking about the, the promise for Abraham to be the father of many nations. It was faith. You see, Abraham could only have that, that heritage, that legacy of children, if he did the right things that would cause that. Right? Now, I want you to get what I'm saying. So, so just give me a signal, say amen if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Abraham had to do the right things in order to get the promise that God wanted. Does that make sense? Right, okay. Now, how did he know to do the right things? Well, he heard from God and he believed God. So in order to do the right things, you first have to believe God. You first have to have faith. So Abraham, while his name was Abram, his name had not yet been changed. Let, let, me, let me try to translate it into uh, maybe New Testament terms, he wasn't yet saved, but even in that state, if he was going to get the promises, he had to believe God. He had to have faith in God. So the thing about it is it all begins with faith. And then he actually goes and does what is righteous. Righteousness begins with faith. They, they believe in something, but how will they know it if they don't hear it? How will they know it if they don't see it modeled? How will they know it if you don't live it? They won't. So righteousness begins with faith. Faith comes from them seeing what you're doing. It's the unsaved I'm talking about. And so if they see you doing what they are doing, 
There's nothing for them to follow. But if they see you changed and they become inquisitive about why have you changed, then their faith begins to build. God uses you and me to be the book that they're going to read before they get into the book. You got to do it. Abraham was to do what was right, but he had to do what was just. Micah 6, 8 extends this to all of mankind. He says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Listen, you and I must be just and righteous even when it's inconvenient to do so. Even when it's inconvenient to do so. You know, I sometimes wonder, think about this. God was in charge of everything. He is, but he was in charge of everything. He created everything brand spanking new. It belonged to him. He could do whatever he wanted with it. So I ask myself the question sometimes and say, so then when Adam and Eve sinned and messed up, the issue was really about the devil. Oh Lord, you had already conquered. Why didn't you just change the rules and kick him out? Like, like if God had done, we couldn't argue that. The devil couldn't argue that. God's in charge. He does whatever he wants. So why didn't he do that? Because even God, as the creator and sustainer of everything that is, is just. And justice required that after Adam and Eve disobeyed him, that the consequence should follow through. So Satan had his day only because God is just. And when it was inconvenient to do so, He followed through and Satan assumed stewardship over the earth that God created and gave to man. It was inconvenient, but God went through with it. More than that, it was inconvenient, but he came down into human flesh and died on the cross to purchase back that salvation that he could have taken just like that and nobody could have argued. God is just. And he's saying to Abraham, You need to do what is just. You need to do what is right. A child is like a blank sheet. And and, 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 and when when a child comes to you, a spiritual child or a natural child, until they can write, you are the one that's writing their story. You write on that sheet. And when they eventually learn how to write, when they come of age and can make their own decisions, more than likely they will follow the storyline that has already begun. It's very difficult to go on to another story when you've only got one page. And that's why you raise up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But you do that. You do that. Here's the thing. If you, if you say to your child, it's important to go to church, and then on Sunday you take them to soccer, they will hear what you said, but they will follow what you do. We were at a conference at a, at a nice church, and um, it was good to hear. They were millennials. I, think, I guess they may be in their early 40s, the pastor and his wife. And the pastor was speaking. It was nice to hear. It was so nice to hear. You know, we had a phase there, and we're still in that phase a little bit here, where we started canceling services. Oh, no, we don't need Sunday night service. Oh, no, we don't, you know. And then, oh, man, we need coffee. Oh, you know, all of, we, all of these things we needed to do were very, very important. I, I was looking for the scripture and verse. I couldn't find it. But that was what we were doing, changing everything. When I say we, I'm talking about the wider church, right? It was interesting to hear this because, because so for me, I've been around a little bit, so I saw these guys when they were younger, And um, it was so interesting because now that they had the power and they are now the pastors, you know what they're doing? They are reintroducing Sunday, or they have reintroduced Sunday night service. Why would you do that? It was so wrong that we took it away. Why do you want to do that? You know what they said? They said because what they found out is that their kids were growing up and the things that they took for granted that they had not given to their kids, it was starting to show. The kids couldn't pray. 
The kids were talking more about things in the world than they were about things in the church. And they got to see, it's only a matter of time we're going to lose these kids completely. Why? Because we felt that Sunday evening service is too much. I'm not spending all my time in church. I'm going to live different. Yeah, live different. You know the Lord. Watch out for your children. They will follow not what you say how I grew up. They'll follow what you do with them, and that's what they'll become. So don't make that mistake. Let us model the way for our children. It's not enough to tell children, oh, you know, God's name, one of his names is Jehovah Jireh. Well, Daddy, what does Jehovah Jireh mean? It means the God who provides. Oh, that's good. And then Abraham gave a tenth of, oh, that's good, all right, good. And then when it's time for you to give, you're finding it a hard time to give the two pennies that you can rub together in your fingers is difficult to give to, to the kingdom of God. Watch this. This is important. The, what you learned when you were growing up gives you what you have today. Like today you're worshiping and enjoying yourself, serving the Lord, getting blessed. That's because people were obedient to God in their actions back then. Now, if you think, okay, hey, look what we've got. We can sail now. What you're doing is you're setting your children up to have a horrible future. Don't kid yourself. Your children are going to follow what you do. And when they follow what you do, you may be very, very unhappy with the results that they bring to you. Fortunately, this particular preacher, they saw what was happening. They jumped right back on it. Sunday evening service, 6.30. 6 o'clock, they come to the altar and they bring their children and make them tarry. Was that the word they used to use? Tarry here until snot's coming out of their mouth looking for the Holy Ghost. That's what they do. You've got to act it out for your children. I'm, I'm feeling lonely in here. Can someone just, yeah, someone shout Hallelujah. I want to give you one more principle. God chose Abraham so that he would bring about for him what he has promised him. You see, he chose him because he wanted to give him what he had promised him. Watch what happened. You, did you realize that when, when Abraham was living in Ur of the Chaldees, his father Terah took the family and they started going to Canaan. When they got to Haran, they stopped and they put down anchors there. They stopped there so long that Haran, uh, sorry, that Terah, Abraham's dad, actually died. He lost the dream. Somewhere along the road, I mean, I don't know what happened there. All I know is that they were headed for Canaan, but they stopped in Haran and they never moved. In fact, when God came to Abraham after Terah died, he said, I have a promise for you. I want you to go to Canaan where you were going. I add that for emphasis. And Abraham went just with a small portion with Lot, his nephew, and, and his immediate family, and off he went and left his family in Haran to go to the promised land because God had given a promise that Terah did not fully follow through on. Now, I don't know if the Bible doesn't say if Terah had the promise, but it does say that he left her of the Chaldees to go to Canaan, but he didn't get there. He stopped. Abraham, God wanted to give him the promise, but he can't give him the promise. In Haran, he's got to get to Canaan. And so Abraham completes the journey, and then, and then God gives him what's called the Abrahamic blessing. There's two parts to it. The first is God says, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. So remember, God's, Abraham is, is walking with the Lord as the Lord is going down towards Sodom, and the Lord is kind of thinking this. He's thinking, Abraham is going to, be, he's going to become a great and powerful nation. That's the first part of the Abrahamic promise, where God actually promises, I'm going to read it here, um, he promises, he says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. He's talking about Abraham's net natural seed. That's what, he's talking about Israel. He's saying that I'm going to bless you from your natural seed. That's the first part. And so the choice 
to follow God's way is going to cause this blessing of his natural offspring centuries down the road. I don't think it's possible for us to carry that in our minds and get it. That the decision you make with your children today is going to have a powerful impact in the year 3000. It's theoretical. You got to have faith and believe God that I'm that important that I better conduct my children. You have to have faith, otherwise you'd never do it. That's for the natural offspring, but there's more. God then said, all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Genesis 2, 3, the second part of the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. God's promises that he wants to give you are cumulative. In other words, they are built one upon the other. Usually one lifetime is not enough for the full vision that God has for you to be realized. And so that's why when we look at chapter 11 of Hebrews and we go through the, 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 the heroes of faith there, we see God talking about people who were looking in faith. They did not receive the promise, but they kept pushing as though they were holding the promise. They believed in it that much, but the promise was manifest generations from where they were, yet it was through them that the promise was transmitted. Here's the key for us. God wants to give us a promise that is bigger than us, that's bigger than our lifetime. Some of you were here when Pastor Castro at the faith celebration in 2022 preached, and he talked about a meeting he had with Pastor F.W. McKenzie when he was young, when, when Castro was young, and he said uh, that, that F.W. McKenzie explained to him how God wanted the church to take Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, Jerusalem has been taken in, 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 in a sense. We now have a church that's in Toronto that people know. People know this church. They know that this is a place to meet with God. Jerusalem has been taken. In Pastor Granville's time of, of, of pastoring, perhaps Judea was taken. Over 10 daughter works that came out of this church are now set in order in autonomous churches around the GTA. It might be something like, something like Judea. So where are we? My responsibility in this day is to inspire this church that we must take Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. We must. That is a promise. We must, and we must work towards that end. Which is why we want this church to know what the Bible says and what it means. We want this church to be a place where culturally you don't have to walk over walls and climb over barriers to be at home at the feet of Jesus. We want not to have any barriers to people coming to know the Lord. We want people to be able to become the very best that God created them to be in the church and in your secular spaces. Because God wants to give us the influence in Canada, if we think about Samaria in, in, in the prophetic sense, we are to have influence in this great nation. Yes, great nation. Great because of the greatness that God wants to do through us and reverse some of the evil that is perpetrating our society. It's us. It's a promise. And then God wants us to feed Canada in that way. 
so that we can feed the world. I'm telling you, our job, we, we can talk about all of that and we must and it's good and it's a vision. Our job today is raise your children in the way of the Lord. That's our job. Raise your children in the way of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor, tell them. Raise your children in the way of the Lord. Type it online. Raise your children in the way of the Lord. Natural and spiritual. Say it again. Raise your children in the way of the Lord. Turn to somebody else and tell them. Raise your children in the way of the Lord. If you're close to Kevin and Shanice, put your hands around them and say, raise your children in the way of the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. That's the word of the Lord for today. Praise Jesus. I'm excited because I know God is doing amazing things. I know God is doing it. And now what I want to do is I, I want us to pray for a few moments. Amen. And the ministers and the directors are coming to the front. We have many reasons in the congregation that you will need prayer. Many reasons. Some of you are standing in the gap. Um, Sister Veronica Taylor is going into surgery today. We want to pray for her. Um, there are many, many, many needs that people have. If you have a need, I'm encouraging you to come forward right now. It could be a need for healing. It could be a need for deliverance. It could be a need for uh, some financial area. It could be a need related to relationships. Come to the front. We want to pray for you. Come to the front. We want to pray for you. Because, because what we're doing is these, these here are spiritual parents. They want to feed you with the grace of the Lord. They are the vessels through which, by which God is going to touch you. So come forward. Because, because you're going to grow. This is part of the raising of children in the way of the Lord. So come forward. Come forward for prayer. Amen. And then, most importantly, this, I mean, we're all about children being born. Today, we have a baptism. Amen. So I want to, I really want to explain to you what that's about. Listen, um, ooh, I'm getting excited. I'm really getting excited. You know one of the problems of, of being a pastor? When you see something that makes you want to run around the church, you have to just stay cool. And, and you have to maintain privacy so you're not allowed to say things. But if you knew what I knew, you would be jumping right now. I'm telling you. Listen, um, if you don't know Jesus, the truth of the matter is that God loves you and he wants you to come into a relationship with him. But there's only one way you're going to be able to do that. There is no other way but the way of the Lord. And the way you do that is you turn away from your sins. You've got to say, even if you think you're stuck, you can never change, you've got to turn away from your sins. You have to make the decision. Like Abraham, when his name was Abram, you have to have faith before you even get into a relationship with God. You have to turn away from your sins and say, I don't want them anymore. You then have to accept the Lord Jesus into your life and be baptized in his name. That baptism, what it does is it washes away your sins. Now, you don't understand that fully. That's okay. You're doing this by faith. As you go down into the water, we'll baptize you and your sins will be buried. And you come up a new creature in Christ, a new person. And he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. That's what qualifies you to be saved. It's nothing really that you can do of your own except that you turn to him and follow what he says. That's all. He does everything. So if you are not saved and you want to give your life to the Lord, when you come up, please just mention that to the, the minister or the director and they are going to, they're going to help you. 
I'm going to pray and then I'm going to close the service and, uh, and you'll be able to go. But if you want to stay for the baptism, we encourage that. If you want to continue to worship and, and just, we just encourage you to just hang out in the presence of the Lord. But I'm going to pray and I will close the service. And so, let's lift our hearts up to the Lord. Jesus, we worship your holy name today. We bless you, we magnify you. You are God, there is none beside you. Move in this place, Lord, as you have promised that you would. Touch people that have needs, my God. Bring salvation, the miracle of salvation into the lives of people today. Touch the hearts of the parents, whether we are spiritual parents or natural ones. Touch the hearts of the parents. Lord, help us to see things through your eyes, to follow your way as you have given it, so that you might be glorified, and so that the promise that you have for us will be manifest. For I have declared, says the Lord, that this is the generation that the promises I have given to you will be manifest. I will send people from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, like rushing waters, they will come into my house. And you must serve them faithfully and teach them my way, says the Lord. For I have trusted you and I have called you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. It's a holy moment. We're going to just continue worshiping. God bless you if you need to leave. Amen. Thank you for coming to church. We love you. We love you. Shake somebody's hand before you go. But if you're praying, we've got some work to do. Let's get to it. Please.